Hey everyone, thanks for being here today at Woodside. Our current Easter series is intended to help develop a faith that's not only personal, but also helps to get the most out of life. You know at Woodside, we are one church with 14 locations across Southeast Michigan. And we stream our services to not only give you a window into our church, but also to help create a doorway into community. And the best way to get connected in community, if you live in Southeast Michigan, is to get to one of our physical churches. You can find locations and service times at woodsidebible.org slash locations. We'd love to meet you face to face. If you live outside of Michigan, you can still experience community by inviting someone to watch Woodside online with you. And hey, if you're watching with some friends right now, take a photo of you and your group and post to social media and give us a few details about your group and use the hashtag, hashtag Woodside Online. We'll keep an eye out for it. And who knows, we might even give your group a shout out next week. Well, we've got a wonderful service planned today. So I'm going to get out of the way because Woodside Online starts right now. Good morning. And have a seat. And good morning, Woodside. It is great to be with you today as we're worshiping this morning. I couldn't help but think that this, uh, this was home for us, for my wife and I and our family for so many years. And, uh, and all the family is still here. They're here in this service. And it still feels like home. Although we don't get here as often as we like to, I'm speaking in a number of other churches or visiting churches to help with their pastors and their leadership development, but it's uh, good to be home. It was either interesting as I'm getting ready to come up here and preach. Um, I'll preach in churches of 150, and I'm nervous. <laughs> but I come here to speak to thousands, and I'm not nervous, and I think it's because of home. And I'm so, I'm so thankful for Pastor Chris. <clears throat> The Woodside has become almost like the Church of Thessalonica and that it's become a model church for churches in the areas. I work with pastors. They'll reference, they learn this from Woodside. I want to do this like Woodside. So this place is very, very special. And I hope you know that. Even uh, as we talk about succession planning and transitions, it's so unusual to have the pastors uh, still in the church going back to 1970 when Dave and Mary Anderson came here. Uh, so the pa Pastor Dave's here, I'm here, and this is unusual, but it's the way it should be. But in large part because you've got a giant as a pastor and Pastor Chris, giant in, in every way. So we're very, very thankful for that. Well, this is, uh, can I tell you a word about Barnabas Ministries of Michigan before we get started in the Word? Um, it's something that uh, we've been doing about a year and a half before we left here in May of 2019. And our mission statement is, the long version is kind of clunky, but it, it, it helps you understand our mission. It's to encourage and resource pastors and churches to be all that God wants them to be. And I think you realize that it's hard, there's a hard day for pastors. Uh, some of their wounds are self-inflicted, we get that. But other, but other than that, it's just a hard, hard job ranking high in the hard job surveys that often take place. Um, the, the statistics actually have gotten a little bit better since COVID, but right now, a one out of every six pastors has contemplated uh, taking his own life. Uh, and thankfully, it, very few act on it, although about three weeks ago, we had a funeral for a pastor um, who fit that category in his early 30s. So just very, very sad. 25% of pastors admit to some form of mental illness, but I think in large part that's depression. And so they're just dealing with that. So these are real, real issues. And so we're, we try to uh, come alongside pastors, help them to, to know and understand that they're never alone. Uh, we put them in mentor groups. So, so we've, uh, Pastor Dave Anderson and I have had these mentor groups. We've trained uh, probably 80 or 90 uh, pastors to lead these groups across mostly Southeast Michigan, but now into West Michigan. And now we've helped start mentor groups around the country uh, with a goal of having a pastor mentor movement in every state. And then just in the last uh, year, we've opened up to international mentoring of pastors. And so we've, we're mentoring uh, 
Uh, we just brought on Eli Garza, who heads up our international mentoring of pastors. We're mentoring pastors in about 20 different countries right now. And so just a few weeks ago, we had a, a couple with us in the service here from Poland. He pastors a church there, and he's in charge of all of the uh, leadership development in Poland for the young pastors in the Baptist denomination. So it's really working out well. Uh, the need is great, but they know they're never alone. Uh, and the, the peer, peer mentoring is a huge component of that as well. We do podcasts that come out every Monday. Uh, those are not only um, the audio, but also video podcasts. They're excellent in, uh, the, in content and production. All those are archived on our website. Um, and then we do lunch and learn events. We're planning on another one. We've, we've uh, beta tested it but plan on another one, there'll be about five or six on the role of artificial intelligence uh, in our culture today and in the church and in the life of a pastor. So that'll be very, very valuable. And then we do the retreats. And the retreats are uh, for pastors to get away. A lot of times it's to help them learn to be preaching preachers better. Uh, sometimes it's uh, to help them to be better uh, uh, shepherds. Uh, sometimes just learning leadership lessons. We got one coming up next month with Joe Stoll. We just had Greg Surratt in uh, in January for that <clears throat> same purpose. But whatever the content of the retreat is, my real purpose is getting them there, getting them together, getting them connected so they know they're never alone. Uh, so our concentration for the first six years has been on pastors. We're broadening that now to encourage and resource pastors and churches. Um, there are 300, uh, approximately 375,000 churches in the U.S. Um, of Protestant churches, although that uh, nobody knows the exact number. But the mean size, the mean church is 60, which means half of those 375,000 are less than 60 in attendance on Sunday morning. Think about it. The other half are larger with only 5% of all churches being more than 500 in attendance on Sunday morning. And so some of those churches are really, really struggling uh, just to, to get by. Uh, it's, it's predicted by Tom Rayner, Sam Rayner, and others that in the next three years, 10,000 churches will close each of those three years. So we've got oh, some work to do. So we've been working on this, studying it, and putting materials together uh, to launch the Center for Church Revitalization under Barnabas, where our first cohort group uh, is made up of 10 churches where they, they go through an assessment program before they get in to be candidates to make sure that there's still enough life that are left in the church and they don't need to be closed down and restarted a year later. There's enough life for revitalization. <clears throat> then a, a team from the church, a pastor and one or two uh, people from the church will meet at the lodge for a week. And during that week, we'll get to know each other. We'll spend time uh, doing a, a deep a SWOT analysis and then learning the principles of revitalization. And there'll be four coaches there. And at the end of the week, each church will have a, a customized plan to see their church revitalized over the next year. And the coach will walk through that with them. And then after the end of that year, it will be another retreat to kind of celebrate and recalibrate. So we're very, very excited. We like to do three of those every year minimally. But if it works here, that can be reproducible around the country. And hopefully, the Lord will use that to see uh, some churches and their trajectory changed and the kingdom advance through the gospel message. So pray with us on that. And to make all of that really uh, special was uh, not only Woodside's support of Pastor Ray and myself and our team, a uh, large, large team of mostly volunteers, but even the gifting recently of the lodge is uh, it's, um, um, it's really, really special. And we're very, very thankful. And uh, we want to commit to you uh, first of all, thank you, uh, and Pastor Chris and the leadership here, but also commit to you that our, our, we'll do the very, very best we can to steward that resource for its purposes of marriage, strengthening marriages, leadership development, and encouragement of pastors. So thank you, and um, some good things ahead. We've got, I think, 26 retreats scheduled so far this year, and we want to get that up to about uh, 40 to 50, so Lord willing, that'll happen. Are you ready to get into the Word today? Yeah, good answer. Yeah, good answer. Uh, 
even though we wanted a better outcome for Oakland University last night, didn't we? But it's so exciting to see what, what, the, what happened there uh, and that they went so far and it's just a great, great story. But there's a better story. And that's what happened on that Palm Sunday morning so many years ago. Would you join me in John chapter 12? John chapter 12, this, this story, this begins Passion Week, which uh, you already know is the most exciting week of the year for those who are followers of Jesus. It's a, a great week, and if you could envision the city of Jerusalem, uh, a golden city, the sun shining on it, the white, yellow limestone is just beautiful. All the same, uh, the city is lighting up, and it's filled with people. And all, th all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all talk about what happened that Sunday morning. And when you, you harmonize all of those four gospels, you get about 14 different features, uh, events, or details of what happened that week. Uh, John will handle six of them. The first three, the same as the other three authors. Uh, the last three, you can only find in the gospel of John. And so we would, and, and John's purpose in writing the entire book, because he'll spend a lot of time on the events of just this last week, starting in chapter 12. His purpose in writing is found in the 20th chapter in the 31st verse. He said, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So that's been my prayer as we get into this today, that it will deepen our belief. And perhaps for those today who are here and you don't have that belief yet, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that this may be a day that, that God would draw you close and some of those dots would be connected by the Spirit of God and that you might have that life. So just to get the context here, let me read from chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came. Not only, on account, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. What about you? Would you rather see the one who was raised from the dead or the one who raised him from the dead? And for many of those people, it was both. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Just a little commentary. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. He doesn't stay in the grave long. Because on account of him, so many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. What a great story. The, the point I want us to get this morning, that believing in Jesus has to show in our lives. If we believe in Jesus, it should show. It's got to be more than a cross on a necklace or a tattoo on an arm. It's got to show in our lives. How? How? Three different ways we'll find as we learn from the worshipers that morning. The first way is believing in Jesus means we honor Jesus as king. Let me read it starting in verse number uh, 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it's written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. There are just four things I want us to highlight on those, those verses. The first one is crowd. The second one is palm branches. The third is their worship, Hosanna. And the fourth is the young donkey. So let's dig a little bit deeper. First of all, the crowd. <clears throat> this was Passover, which led into a week-long feast. But when you read Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, it says that all of the men of the nation had to gather three times a year for these three main festivals. This was not an option. They had to come. So coming from all over Jerusalem, all over Israel, and surrounding countries, they would migrate there once a year. It was a celebration. Uh, the Bible talks about the, the joy that they would have in celebrating as they would get together. It was a family thing. 
Um, Josephus, a, a first century Jewish historian, once wrote, he said, the, the Passover that was just before the Jewish wars, 66 to 70 AD, there were 2.7 million people that were gathered together for worship, uh, coming to, to that festival. Well, <clears throat> now add to the number a level of excitement because Jesus had just brought forth a man from the grave. That's going to be very, very exciting. It's, uh, it doesn't happen every day, folks. And so he, he brought Lazarus forth from the grave. I can only imagine if the family was there gathered and Jesus was there after a delayed visit and ministering to, uh, to, uh, to Mary and Martha. If you'd only been here, our brother wouldn't have died, this kind of thing. And if you'd, if you'd just believe and... Um, that whole dialogue is fantastic. And Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And later on in that chapter, he says, Lazarus, come forth. And I, I imagine in my mind this Lazarus who went in horizontal is coming out vertical. And he's wrapped in these linens, walking out alive, alive. The people couldn't get over it, as you can imagine. I th I'm sure there were some who, were, who weren't there who said, yeah, he probably wasn't dead, just as they said of Jesus. He probably wasn't dead. The coolness of the tomb revived his spirits. And the people who were there said, trust me, he was dead. He'd been in the grave four days, he was dead. And so there was an excitement level as the crowd was building. They wanted to see the man who'd been raised from the dead and then they wanted to see the one who raised him. They heard he was wake, making his way to Jerusalem, so they're there. Then I want you to notice the palm branches. The palm branches. <clears throat> when you go back into the Old Testament, you'll read about the festivals and how the, during those festivals they would use the palm branches uh, to worship, to wave the palm branches, perhaps place them in the pathway. Palm branches were symbolic of a, a, a couple of things. One of them, righteousness. Psalm 92 verse 12 says that you might flourish like the palm branches. Your righteousness might flourish like the palm branches. And so there was that the sense of righteousness, a sense of peace, and there was joy. And they were waving with the palm branches. It was again symbolic of the way they've done it as they worship. And this was a, again a fulfillment. The... Um, and then there was the worship at them itself, Hosanna. This means save us. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This was a quotation that we find in Psalm 118, used with the deliverance uh, by David. And so they're singing this song, but now they're singing it as it relates to Jesus, the coming Messiah. It's a psalm that they would sing at Passover. And, and by the way, it's a psalm that was believed to be sung by the early church. Remember reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where it says, And the church gathered to celebrate uh, the Lord's table, the breaking of the bread. And, and they would sing some of those psalms, uh, Psalm 113, 114, before the celebration. And afterwards, Psalm 117, Psalm 118. So what we were doing this morning is, is very typical of what was happening, not only in the, for the Passover, but also for the church through many, many centuries of observing this command. Um, I want you to notice as well, the uh, Jesus riding on the donkey. If you're his advisor at that time, you probably wouldn't have recommended a donkey. Um, he's king. Kings don't ride donkeys. You'd expect them to ride a horse, a big, beautiful horse. And yet Jesus, the way he presented himself in humility was totally upside down of the world of that day and the world of our day. He presented himself in humility and he chooses a donkey, a donkey's colt to ride in. Don't misunderstand. There will come a time where Jesus will ride a horse. He's coming um, in Palm Sunday as a lamb. One day he'll come as a lion. And you read in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 15, they'll come riding on a horse and he'll speak 
the Bible says a sword will proceed out of his mouth, symbolic of speaking. And with the sword, with the word, the armies of the world will be destroyed. He came as a lamb, but he'll come again as a lion. We have to be ready. The, the way we're ready is accept him as a lamb. And so <clears throat> he came riding in on the, on the colt and to, uh, to this huge crowd of people. I remember <clears throat> it was years ago, it was a Palm Sunday. I preached the message on Palm Sunday um, from the book of Luke. And I went into the foyer afterwards, and there was a man. Uh, he was visibly upset. And he talked with me right over here in the, right on the other side of this wall. And he said, I can't believe it. I came here on Palm Sunday, and we didn't have palm branches. <laughs> and I thought, ooh, this, this, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have an answer for this one. So he asked why, and if he'd come from a tradition where the palm branches were very much a part of the ritual of worship. And I explained, tried to explain the difference between what was found in the text as prescriptive, in other words, it's commanded, and what's descriptive, they're just describing the way it happened, and this was descriptive, and we're not commanded necessarily to worship with palm branches. And I could tell that my explanation wasn't working, and uh, he was very upset, and wanted palm branches, and he went out after the service and got palm branches. And then he came Easter, and he met with me, and he said, I get it. It's not about the palm branches. It's about the heart. It's about the heart. Do we recognize that he is the king, and we honor him as king? What John doesn't tell us, Luke fills in. And the Bible says when Luke was writing this, <clears throat> or when Luke was observing and then writing, Luke said that he was coming down the Mount of Olives on that colt of a donkey. That he's weeping. That should cause us to ask some questions. When Jesus weeps, do you want to know why? I do. He wept a chapter earlier at the death of Lazarus, and we can figure that out, and two or three legitimate reasons why he wept. Now he's coming down to thousands and thousands of people who are crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, save us. And he's weeping. Luke gives us two reasons why he wept. The first reason is he said, because the people didn't understand what makes peace. They were looking for a military leader, and they thought anybody that can bring a man forth from the grave can certainly overthrow the Romans and lead us into independence, take off our shackles, and we're free as a nation to serve God. They didn't get it. They didn't understand him and his mission. The second reason that Luke gives us uh, for the, the tears of Jesus is they didn't understand the day of God's visitation. And that expression, day of God's visitation, you'll find throughout the Old Testament. And it's somewhat of a technical term that refers to a visitation from God, either an angel of the Lord or the angel of the Lord, often considered to be a pre-incarnate Jesus, who would come and, and visit either for one of two purposes. Blessing, you're going to have a baby, or judgment, there's judgment coming. Jesus lived amongst these people, and they didn't know who he was. They didn't understand completely. And the tears of Jesus were the acknowledgement of that. They didn't understand the day of God's visitation. May I suggest to you as well <clears throat> that God still visits. <clears throat> when we don't understand his day, the day of God's visitation and blessing, <clears throat> One day we'll actually have to experience the day of God's visitation in judgment. We don't want that. There's a second response to living, believing in Jesus has to be seen in our lives. First of all, by honoring Jesus as king. And then secondly, by bearing witness to Jesus' work. Let's pick it up in verse number 12. Excuse me, verse number 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first. 
But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done on or to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. I underline continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him uh, was that they had heard he had done the, this sign, the raising of Lazarus. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. I read these verses and on the surface, they're very, very simple. And yet we have to understand, uh, better understand the depth of them, that there are three different groups there that day. The first group were the disciples. They had been chosen and called by God. Their stories are told in the early part of each of the gospels. Matthew, Mark, you got the list, James, John, they all followed. They followed Jesus. And then you have, uh, but they didn't get it. They didn't understand. It wasn't until later, and I can only imagine later after Jesus was glorified that the Holy Spirit connected some of those dots and they're saying to one another, how could we have missed that? How could we have missed it? Zechariah talked about that 500 years before. We read it. We studied it. How could we have missed it? And so they then acknowledge, like, way too late. So those were the disciples. Uh, the second group were the crowds. The crowds that had witnessed the raising of Lazarus or had heard about it. And the people who had witnessed the raising of Lazarus, the Bible says, continued to bear witness. Once they've seen God work, <clears throat> they couldn't keep silent. And the third group were the Pharisees. And you read about them in verse number 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And so it, it, I think if I understand verse 19 correctly, it's the, 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 the hardcore Pharisees who wanted to kill Jesus and who want to kill Lazarus. They're saying to the moderate Pharisees, almost I told you so. We told you so. We should never have let him live. And now the whole world is following after him. They saw the crowds. And there's something that bothers me about all of this yet that <clears throat> we got to figure out. Let me take you back and see the, like the MO of Jesus and how he handled the crowds previously. When he preached the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's followed by chapters 8 and 9, where Matthew just chronicles for us miracle after miracle after miracle that Jesus performed. Um, and everyone is uh, fascinated. And Jesus, uh, I think, is trying to show them, this is who I am. I'm a miracle worker. But he wanted them to know much, so much more than that. The first miracle that's talked about, he's coming down from the mountain. There's a great crowd with him. And the Bible says a leper <clears throat> comes out in front of him and kneels down and says, if you will, you can heal me. Jesus would respond, but before he does, let's, let's make sure we understand what this leper is all about. <clears throat> Leprosy is a, a broad term that involved a number of different skin diseases. And so if a person started noticing things on his skin, that looked like leprosy, I mean, that would get your attention. Uh, there is no cure for it. And so by Old Testament law, they had to go present themselves to the priest. The priest would probably mark it and said, come back in X number of days. And if they came back and that leprosy or that skin disease had spread, they were determined to be lepers. And if you're a leper, that meant in, in, in different times during church or during Old Testament history, they had to live in a separate colony outside of the city. And on occasion, if they, they couldn't come close and come into contact with anybody who didn't have leprosy without first covering their upper lip and yelling out, unclean, unclean. They couldn't worship in the temple because leprosy was considered, it would make them ceremonially unclean. So to understand this, put yourself in the position of a leper and you go to the priest and the priest said, I got bad news for you. You're going to have to move. Well, I'm engaged to be married. 
No, you were engaged to be married. That's not happening. I just got a new job. You're not going to be working there. Your life completely changes. And there's, there, there is no cure for it other than supernatural intervention. And yet throughout the Old Testament, we have one story recorded of healing of leprosy, and that was Miriam. And so there's no hope. Your only hope is to find one who has performed miracles and hoping you'll be on his list. And so he knelt down and said, if you will, heal me. And Jesus responded by saying, I will be whole. And I love the next sentence because the word is used in several of the miracles, but not all of them. Immediately, immediately, he was clean. He got up from his feet. Can you imagine? Immediately. There are sometimes, remember when Jesus healed the, the uh, 10 lepers in, in Luke chapter 17. When he healed them, he didn't heal them immediately. He sent them off to the priest. As, as they're walking to the priest, then they were in the process of being healed. That would been kind of cool to watch, wouldn't it? You're getting clean. And Jesus would send them to the priest uh, because of the law. But there may have been another reason. Is it possible that Jesus sent them to the priest as a testimony to the priest? That what you've been teaching and what you've been preaching about a Messiah that is to come, he's here. And can you imagine a priest after viewing all these different patients coming through with leprosy, and they come through, you're not any better, you're not any better, you're not any better. And all of a sudden, one comes in, and he's completely healed. And you say, how did that happen? And like the blind man who was healed in John 9 said, I don't know, I was once blind, now I see. I just, I had leprosy. I asked this man to help me, and immediately I became clean. Great witness to a religious leader. And then Jesus says something in Matthew chapter 8 that, uh, that's hard to understand. Very, very difficult to obey. Where Jesus said, now, to this leper, go, but don't tell anybody. Go and don't tell anybody. Why would he say that? You find the same thing in Mark chapter 5. You find the same thing in Luke chapter 7. Where he, in Mark chapter, uh, uh, I believe it was 5, uh, a man comes and the Bible says he kneels down. He asks the same thing. He said, Master, would you, he's, he's deaf. And the Bible say, uses a word that he, he can't speak clearly. And that word in the Greek language is only used this one time in the whole New Testament. But it is used back in Isaiah in the Greek translation called the Septuagint of the Old Testament. There's a word that's used that when he comes, Jesus, he will make the blind to see. He will make the deaf to hear. And he'll make the one who has difficulty speaking, speak. And it's almost as if Luke is reminding us, he's come. He's come. I, th- I was thinking this week <clears throat> that I, I, I golfed with probably a couple hundred men from Woodside over the years. Um, and one thing is common among all the guys I've golfed with from this church. Every one of them is a better golfer than I am. <laughs> Even Pastor Steve. Uh, every one of them is a better golfer. But do you think that bothered me? Yeah, sort of. It did, yeah. <laughs> a lot. But I knew, I knew I had something that most of those guys didn't have. I had a hole in one. But do you think I would use that against them? Every chance I got. <laughs> so we may finish a round of golf, and the guys, uh, what's your score? And Well, I got a 79. Well, great. Well, I got an 88. Well, great. Well, Pastor Doug, what did you get? <clears throat> 101. But then I could easily say, 
let's tell hole in one stories. <laughs> you guys go first. <laughs> but do you think I did that? Yeah, I did. <laughs> Once something like that happens, um, if you were to win a lottery of a billion dollars, but they say you can't tell anybody. You just got engaged. A friend of mine called me this week. He said, I'm playing Pebble Beach. That wasn't the reason we, we were talking. <clears throat> but he couldn't wait for a break to tell me he was going to play Pebble Beach this week. So when something good happens, we have to witness the greatness of our God to a world that needs to see his mission. So I think Jesus sent him away saying, don't say anything, because he didn't want the crowds to swell so much and misunderstand who he was before they understood the clarity of his mission. His time had not yet come. And so on that Sunday morning, you might expect Jesus to retreat to a mountain to pray because of all of the crowds, because that was his MO. Instead, he just does the opposite. And he comes down the Mount of Olives to a crowd of people because his time had come. I think about this, and it's, it's, to me, it's very convicting. I wonder which is more forgivable and which is more understandable. When Jesus heals a leper and commands him, sternly charged him not to tell anybody, and they disobey. Or for those of us who have seen the work of God in our lives, transformed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, in a moment of time recognizing that we, were, we were sinners and we couldn't do anything about it, but in that moment of time, God changed us through Jesus, his son. And he commands us. <clears throat> Some of his last words, go and be my witnesses commands us to do it, and we don't. Which is more tolerable, or which is more understanding? Their failure or our failure? One last thought. Verse 20 and 21. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks or some Gentiles. Uh, these are people who uh, weren't part of the, the, the celebration of the festival, though perhaps they, they were enjoying some of it, but they'd come to the conclusion apparently that there weren't many gods, there were just one God. And they wanted to get to know that one God better. They had questions, they wanted answers. And so he came, so they came to uh, Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. I grew up in a little church, um, South St. Paul, Minnesota, and there was a communion table sitting in the front here we saw every Sunday. But carved in the front of the table were those words, Sir, we would see Jesus. And that was the task of the pastor every Sunday as he opened the word to deliver. Here is Jesus. Here is Jesus, the Jesus you need to know. The Jesus you need to honor as king. The Jesus you need to witness for and the Jesus where you need to pursue his presence. They wanted, they wanted to see Jesus. We're entering the greatest week of the year, Holy Week. This is the, the greatest opportunity. At Woodside, we celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. We know that. We celebrate it every day. But there's no greater day than Easter Sunday. It's the greatest day for worship of a believer. I believe that with all my heart. My wife and I always look forward to Easter uh, services. We went to every one of them here for 28 years. We just loved it. And by Sunday afternoon, there was such a, uh, we, you couldn't settle down because you've just been worshiping all morning. But it's also a great day. I, I say all that to say, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself this week. The devotions that are made available by Woodside, dig into them and let the, the, the events of that time with their meaning kind of overwhelm and wash over your soul to prepare you for the greatest week of worship. Tonight would be a great opportunity 
But Easter Sunday morning is also the greatest opportunity to let people see Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus. I wonder, uh, the studies have been done on this, that like 60 or 70 percent said they would come to a church if somebody invited them. That's easy then, isn't it? And inviting somebody to church is not evangelism, but is one easy way to make sure they hear the gospel. And so we, like those people who would watch Lazarus come forth from the grave and couldn't stop testifying about it, may we never stop testifying about the Lord who delivered us from darkness. The band and praise team is going to come out and we'll prepare our hearts for a time of communion celebration this morning. Each of you probably received this when you came in. Um, this has been practiced for years in the church because God didn't want us ever to forget. And my wife and I were driving in this morning in the rear view mirror we saw, did you see it? The beautiful, brilliant full moon. And then we saw in the front, the sun rising and it was just, we were enveloped in this beautiful picture of God and his brilliance. It made such an impression upon us, but now it's just a memory. And God didn't want the events of that week, particularly the death of Jesus Christ on Friday, to just be a whole hum memory. He wanted it to be life-changing. He wanted us never to forget. So this bread is just a symbol of the broken body of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the, the broken body that was for us. Father, we join our brothers and sisters of centuries past by following those words of instruction. Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. I remember being in seminary and learning a lot of verses by memory. And one of those nights I was sleeping after having memorized verses, my wife woke me up and said, what time is it? And I said, it's 2 Corinthians 5.21. <laughs> I wasn't awake. She repeated the question. I repeated the same answer. And then I woke up. I hope I never forget that verse. Where basically said that God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God. We remember this because this was for us. Together, let's drink. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for who you are. Father, the way you revealed yourself through the sun and the moon, the way you revealed yourself in the scriptures, but Father, the way you revealed yourself through Jesus. I'm thankful that he's changed the lives of so many of us. And yet perhaps, Father, there are a few here, or maybe many here, who are on a journey to know you personally. Lord, I pray that you draw them to yourself. A minister to them. Father, through your word, answer their questions. May they, seek out, may they seek out people where they can say, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Father, I pray that this next week in the life of Woodside would be a, light, a week of great spiritual growth, deep spiritual worship, and great spiritual outreach, for which we'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So at the close of this song, there'll be people, friends here at the front. If you want, want to pray uh, about your, your own walk, your journey with Christ, we encourage you to come. Or if you want prayer in anything, we encourage you to come. I'm so glad you tuned in to Woodside Online today. Whether you've been here for a while or this is your first time, we'd love to connect with you. 
Take a moment and visit woodsidebible.org and use the I'm New button to find out more about our 14 church locations and to get connected. We hope to see you next week, either here online or better yet, at one of our church campuses. We hope and pray you all have a great week.